The word of God is living and active. This is most certainly true. Last week we had a reading from Tobit, and this week we have the reading from Sirach. I had some questions from some folks who weren't at Wednesday Bible studies. A few years ago, we covered all of the official Concordia study Apocrypha. It's a companion volume. Every time we release a new study Bible, there's a raging debate whether or not to include the apocryphal books in the study Bible or not. There's a lot of confusion, particularly in the United States, where Lutherans adapted to life surrounded by other denominations where they kind of shied away from doing things that their neighbors accused them of being too Catholic. But because the Apocrypha have been around since as long as the church in the West, as long as they have existed, Luther himself preached sermons on the Apocrypha. They are cited frequently in our confessions and our documents. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that there was no single printed edition of the Bible until the invention of the printing press. Most Christians for most of Christian history lived without ever laying eyes on a complete Bible. Most congregations were lucky, lucky if they had one copy of one book. For many of them, they were books unknown to us. Some Christians lived their entire life of faith, lived and died with only readings from the book of Tobit or the book of Judith being read at their local congregation. So it's kind of a shame that we got away from them. I'm glad there's the full Lutheran study Bible version of it with the study notes. It's really interesting stuff. The history of the coming together of the canon can be very confusing to people, but the Bible did not fall out of the sky on golden plates to be translated miraculously. If God had delivered his scripture to us in that fashion, it would be a lot simpler. It would also be a lot more complicated in its own way. If the Bible had been handed to us complete and whole from heaven, it would be a miracle. So you would either believe it or not. You would have to believe it or not believe it. It's much more complicated that God delivers his word to many different people over thousands of years in multiple places and languages that leaves us to uncover archaeologically different, slightly different manuscripts here and there and piece it together. It seems so much less reliable and yet it's far more reliable because we can dig it up and find old pieces of it, find pieces from here and there and everywhere, compare and contrast. It gives you one a horrible headache at seminary when you have to remember the names of all the major manuscripts and look at the languages. And Hebrew is a horrific penance I don't wish on anybody, but that's how it goes. The word of God delivered in such a fashion is verifiable, at least it's researchable. You can see it by its continuity. And over multiple authors, we see what we should see. Different vocabularies, different languages, different nuance, but always the fingerprints of the same God. God who struck Paul with blindness until the scales fell from his eyes. Many of us miss that that's a direct reference to what God did in the book of Tobit. When Tobit was struck with blindness and when it was healed, scales fell from his eyes. By not knowing that book, we miss the reference. So the word of God that's given to us is alive, it is living, it is active. It is not actually found in the printed word of the text. It's in what is conveyed. It is the word of God spoken, the word of God preached, the word of God as it was originally written, handwritten by those to whom it was revealed and inspired. For us, it makes it a lot more complicated to find, but again, a lot more verifiable. The real question when dealing with the efficacy of the word of God, finally, he's getting to the gospel text. What kind of soil are we dealing with? This is what Sirach is speaking of in passing. The type of king determines the type of cabinet. The type of magistrate determines who his advisors are. The population of a city determines the nature and character of that city. Different types of soil. Soil in this world, which is fallen and sinful and weak and frail, which needs the word of God to make it alive again, where even in this world, even a king is a king today and a corpse tomorrow. 
Keeping that in mind then, what sort of soil are we dealing with? Now there's a lot of different ways to interpret the parable in the Gospels. Most of them are, well, not very good. I could easily give you a long lecture that says, what kind of soil are you? Are you being rocked today? Are you worn down along the path? Well, you ought to be a better kind of soil so that you can grow fruit for the Holy Ghost. But if I did that, that would be putting the onus entirely on you. That would be saying that it's up to you to decide what kind of soil you're going to be. Make a decision for Jesus and walk a certain path, except we don't do that. We're the ones that were a king yesterday and a corpse today. Being sin, in sin, from the fall into sin, from the garden on, means we are dead in sin. And the dead do not save themselves. The dead do not make a decision for Jesus. The dead do not pull themselves up by their bootstraps and do good work. And certainly soil has absolutely no say in what sort of soil it is. But the parable then serves two functions. First, for the church of Jesus Christ, as it extends into the world, bearing witness of this word that is living and active, a sharp sword, this word, as we deliver it to the world, we have to be aware of what kind of soil we're dealing with. There's all sorts of soil out there in the world, varying degrees of receptive to non-receptive. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a time where agriculture and a word of God, so to speak, is horrifically difficult. We are in a spiritual drought, or rather, a truth drought. In the 20th century, we really thought atheism and evolution were going to be the undoing of people's faith, but instead, it's weird pagan beliefs that cover an entire spectrum. The old religion of multiple gods and every single person is their own god has been revived in new and terrible ways. What kind of soil is that, and how do we reach out to our neighbor? How do we reach out to people with the truth? Do we spend endless hours shoveling the seeds of God's word onto rock, onto a war down path, onto the dry and dead husks of the walking dead zombies that populate our world? No matter what we pour on the corpse of today, it will not again become the king of yesterday. Time takes its toll, history marches on, culture is different, the characteristics of those in the city determine the nature of it, just like a king determines his cabinet and a magistrate, his advisors. The world takes as its counsel the things that tickle its fancy, feed its flesh, and we have literally transitioned from a culture of overwhelming pleasure of drugs, sex, and whatever to those mutilating their own flesh to conform it to their own image. The world has gone mad, and the question must be asked, what kind of soil is the world? I tricked you though, didn't I? Did you catch that? What kind of soil is out there in the world and how are you going to decide to plant your seed? That's actually the second terrible way to preach this parable. While we as the church of Jesus Christ, extending from eternity into time, have the obligation to do what we do in our entire life and existence, bear witness to the truthfulness of God's word that comes down from him that which is living and active. Though we definitely are obligated by his calling, sanctification, and work through us to be a light to the darkness of the world. It is not for you and I to obsess over legalisms or questions of who is worthy or when they are or when they might be. St. Paul, our parish namesake, was an enemy and persecutor of the church who took Christians away to be murdered but when Jesus chose him on the road to Damascus, he becomes a martyr eventually for the faith. That St. Paul enters into heaven to the rejoicing and cheers of the people that he sent there by murdering them is the scandal of the cross. And it reminds us that none of us knows when the word of God, which is living and active, will do its work because it brings us back to the real meaning of the parable. See, nobody in their right mind having grown up on a farm. Nobody in their right mind plants their seed and rock. Nobody tries to plant wheat in their driveway. It's a well-worn path. Nobody wastes seed or effort in this manner. 
The parable is not about you and me. The parable is not even about farming, though the imagery is. The parable is about the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, come into the world to die for our sins and rise again, to cancel out the debt of every sin that has ever been from the beginning of time until the end of it, redeeming everyone who ever lived and ever will live, everything that is in his hand that he made in his cosmos. This God wanders the world throwing out the seed and he is the one that loves the world enough that he pays no attention to where. He throws this seed on the rock, he throws it on the path, he throws it among thistles. Because he loves all equally, he does not withhold where he throws the seed. And the best part is that only he who is fully God and fully man is capable of making a good crop grow on rock, in desert, among thistles, on the well-worn path. The parable is all about the work that Jesus is doing that he is doing through his church with his word what he is doing through his church in the sacraments that the word made flesh working from eternity into time through his church casting this seed under the world the man that loves every filthy degenerate in the world as much as he loves every filthy degenerate sitting in these pews the one who has come into the flesh to cleanse us of our sin to take it away by his blood on the cross the one who calls every, every murderer, thief, every pervert and degenerate that each and every one of us are someplace in the darkness of our hearts. Boy, I lost my train of thought. Every thing that we are in the darkness of our thoughts and our interior sin. Jesus Christ, God and man, who has entered the world to cleanse it, is the one who casts the seed all willy-nilly, everywhere, anywhere, all at once, because he loves all the types of soil equally and he is able to make it take root. So yes, in our day-to-day -day lives, we might wonder about soil and I'm certainly not advising you to plant your carrots in a terrible place in your garden. That would be extending the metaphor too far. But it's the reminder of Jesus that his work in the world that is able to turn us, each type of wretched, dry, rocky, nasty, well-worn, evil soil that we are, that we can be brought here washed and absolved, that we can be fed his body and blood at this altar, to be a well springing up in us to eternal life. He is able to do it for every sinner that ever existed and ever will exist. He will, as he promised, restore everything that is his to himself, even the vastness of the cosmos, even every single bee and blade of grass, the one who lets nothing escape but fulfills all his promises it is Jesus who does the sowing, Jesus who does the work, Jesus who delivers the gift he promised of everlasting life. In his name, amen.